when it comes to God because he is constant. Those of you algebra gurus and pi and geometry and all these things, you know what a constant is. It never changes. And that's what I that's what I see, that's what I have experienced with God in my life. Is that he is constant. He changes not. Amen. So this, this morning, I want to go back a few years and sing a song that I think has been around for a very long time. And we're just going to just focus on the goodness and, and the things that God has done in your lives and just give thanks to Him. Okay? Y'all good to do that with me this morning? Father, we thank you. We are thankful for where we live today. We are thankful, God, for the opportunity that you give to us to come to this place just to worship you from our hearts. And just like that one leper that came back to say thank you to you, you caused a heart change. The others you, you healed physically, but because he came back and he said, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me, you changed and you healed his heart. And God, that's what we're after today is that our hearts can have a change and our hearts can have a revelation of who you are and the magnitude of who you are in our lives. Give thanks with a grateful heart.
Psalm 23, at the very end of that, and it says that surely goodness and mercy, one of, also one of my favorite verses, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit fill this place and that we would understand that your goodness and your mercy follows us like to see almost like you chasing me down <laughs> for your love because you are such a good father you just pour out a huge bucket of water but it's your mercy and your grace upon your daughters and your sons in this place God help us to have that revelation of who you are and what you want to do in us Of the goodness 
think there's anything in my life right now that he hasn't brought me through because I hang on to his word and it says that he will never leave me he will never forsake me he will never walk out on me I'm not an orphan any longer the world can disappoint us right houses can burn to the ground Those things will never give you happiness. I want you to look around at your children, your grandchildren, your family, your friends in this place. He has been so good. There is no thing that anybody could offer me. Riches are gold, just like the song. Houses are land. I wouldn't trade it for him. Well, you can be seated this morning as they bring the lights up. Look around the room, if you would, and see if there's any first-time visitors here. Anybody here for the first time, would you mind to raise your hand? Several of you I haven't seen for a while. I want to see once in a while. It's good to see all of you anyway. Can I get an amen for that? It's going to be a great day today. Just a couple announcements before we get started. Um, Wednesday night life group and classes again this week. Um, I'm sorry, no Wednesday night life group and classes this week um, because of Thanksgiving. So we won't have them this week, but we'll be back the following week. Um, we will be having our holiday dinner. Um, will be Sunday, December 4th, following the service. There's a sign up on Facebook or on the church website. For those of you to sign up if they're coming, correct? And what you would like to bring, we'll have a menu on there um, so we can all bring something and help put that meal together. Um, happy birthday this week to Chelsea Wickert, and that's the only one I have on my list. Am I missing another one? And what? And Grandma Kathy. That would be good. Are the Lewises ready? Okay. We're going to do a baby dedication dedication this morning, and we need just kind of a minute to for them to get up here and 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 get ready. I asked permission for those of you that are starting to get angry. <laughs> the problem is I can't see good enough <laughs> to read this. 
again, I know I'm kind of kind of making a little joke here in the beginning, but I'm going to bring it back around. You guys know that I love baby dedications and things like this, and I take them very seriously, so please don't be offended by this. This was just a little humor. But um, one of the things I love about baby dedications is being able to be part of people's journey, these young couples' journey. And so when we've been able to be a part of their lives over a several-year span and over and through things with them and things like that, it makes it even more special that we get to be a part of praying over these babies and declaring the Word of God over them and things like that. And so I was thinking about the name Maverick this week, and um, so I looked up what the meaning of the name Maverick means. And I thought this would be very fitting, and I'm going to pray it over him here in a few minutes too. But the name Maverick means an independent man who avoids conformity. Because all week long I just kept thinking, God, what's the, what's the thing about Maverick? What's the thing about Maverick? And, and as soon as I read that scripture, how many know the Bible says to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed into the image of his son? of his dear son. Amen. So every time I think about calling somebody Maverick or calling this boy Maverick, I'm, I believe that we're basically declaring he's not going to be conformed to this world, but he's going to be transformed. Amen. Into the image of his dear son. Would you guys stand with me as we pray over this family and over Maverick, Ryan, Charles, Lewis this morning, and the rest of the family. Isn't that a beautiful family? Father, as we come to you today in dedication of this baby, representation even of Jesus when they brought him to the temple, this family, God, is here to dedicate him in front of their family, their friends, and announce their commitment to raise him in the fear and admonition of you. Father, we just speak life and blessing over this baby. As Hannah and, and Simeon did over baby Jesus, we just begin to declare your blessing and your favor and your protection over this child as he grows. And God, no accident of his name that he will not be conformed, but he'll be transformed into the image of your dear son. We just declare that, that he is a special child and that he will do great things for you and your kingdom. We pray your protection, your health, your blessing upon him and upon these parents, God, as they lead this whole family on all these children. God, they're all blessings. They are all a gift from you. And your hand is upon them all just the same. And we just dedicate them to you. We commit their lives to you to, together with them in faith today. In Jesus' name we pray all things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Would you give them a hand? We'll let the kids be dismissed to Children's Church, and we're going to get into the Word. If you would, get your devices or your Bibles out whichever way you prefer. We're going to get back into what we started with a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> For several weeks before that, God had been really dropping this one word in my spirit. And though it's the word limitless, how many really believe that God is limitless? I mean, seriously. I mean, it sounds good to say that, but do we really believe it? And that, that's what I'm after. That's what I believe he's challenging me with personally, and I believe this church, and I believe the body of Christ in this season. I'm hearing more and more people uh, preaching along these lines in this thread or vein, if you will. And I don't know about you, but how many know that um, in life, there's limits on everything? 
One of the ones I hate the most is speed limit. I drive a Chevy. It's hard to keep that thing toned down. But <laughs> speed limit. There's, there, there, there's governor switches on, on all kinds of things. So you can only take it so far. And I understand the protection part of that. And so don't, don't get on my case too bad about this. I'm trying to make a point about limits. There's, 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 we're limited in so many ways. You can only buy so many things or you can only do certain things. And depending on the situation, there's so many limits. And I just believe that God is not, how many know he's not contained or constrained by man's limitations, kind of. Just because there's a rule of this is how things go, or, or maybe we, we have set up a set of um, truths. I think about denominations of churches and, and different groups. They have different uh, uh, basic truths, fundamental truths of their, of their uh, association or their denomination, 17 fundamental truths of one, 10 fundamental truths in another denomination, 23 in another denomination. And they, they try to come up with fundamental truths. And I'm not being mean or trying to take a shot this morning, but how many know God's not limited to our understanding of fundamental truth? He said, I am the way, the truth. Amen. He's the truth. And so there's no limit. And so as we pick back up this week from a couple of weeks ago on the thought of limitless, I want to go back to our original text in Matthew chapter 9. But before that, I want to drop a thought in your head um, also. Let's pray before we start. Father, I'm just asking you today to help me to articulate what I believe you've been burning in my spirit lately. I pray no flesh be glorified in your presence. I pray they don't see me, they see you. They don't hear me, they hear you. But God, I'm asking you right now, Father, in the name of Jesus to speak, to speak into this atmosphere. God, in the beginning, you spoke and things moved. You spoke and things became. And I believe you haven't changed. I believe you've reminded me that when you speak, everything has to obey. And I just pray, God, that you will speak to us today. You'll speak to our, our, in our spirit. You'll speak in our minds. You'll speak in ways that we can see and we can hear individually, each one of us, in whatever way, shape, or form you, you, you do that. I'm asking for you to do that today for your kingdom and your glory. If you agree with me, say amen. amen. So I want to go back, and before that, I want to talk about an Old Testament story that you guys are all familiar with. It is when Moses began to lead the children of Israel out of bondage into a limitless, I mean, promised land. How many know that he began to lead them out of a very limited situation and a limited lifestyle and a limited life and hope, and he was trying to take them to a place of opportunity, complete, limitless to them it would be of the promised land that he was trying to take them to, and he wanted them to dwell in that land. How many really believe that God wants you to dwell in a land like that? Now. Not then. Everybody say now. Now. And I believe that, and I believe this is something that he's really laid on my heart um, recently to share and to remind you guys of. He's leading them out of bondage to a promised land. And how many also know that names were important to God? All through Scripture, names were important, just like this morning. That's why uh, when, I, when I go to dedicate a baby or, or I think about these young parents when they're having children, I, I ask you to sincerely pray over what to call that child, what God says about that child, because all through Scripture, names were important, and what parents named their children and what they called that child and what that meant was important to God, and it's important to us. Amen? How many really believe that? couple of you. We're going good so far. But we don't introduce ourselves. Think about this. We, don't, we do not introduce ourselves to other people by what we do. How, most of the time, 
there are some people who are so ate up with what they do, that's their whole identity, and they're wrapped up in that. But I mean, honestly, when we introduce ourselves to someone, we don't introduce ourselves as, hi, my name is Mike, I'm five foot ten. Or, hi, I'm five foot ten. We say, hi, my name is Mike, right? We don't introduce ourselves by what color we are. We don't introduce ourselves by what we do. We don't introduce ourselves by anything other than our name because names are, are important. And we introduce ourselves to people because we want them to call us that, right? That's our name. That's what I want you to call me. And then we could go a little further with that into nicknames. How many have nicknames? Maybe growing up in your family, you had a little nickname, but how many know not everyone gets to call you that nickname? What someone calls you is a privilege. And so when you have a nickname, I'm going somewhere, stay with me. When, when you have a nickname, there's only certain people can call you that. You get in a group and you, know, you, you and your buddies are there and you've got your nickname and they're calling that and then some new guy walks up and he's like, hey, how you doing, all that, and he tries to call you your nickname. You're like, whoa, stop, whoa. You don't talk to me like that, <laughs> right? You can't call me that. Why? Because we're not close enough yet. We don't have that relationship yet. You can't call me that yet. Everybody say yet. Yeah. We're going somewhere. Can stay with me. God is into names all through Scripture. Names are important, and what you call something is important. In the book of Genesis, God allowed Adam to name all the animals. He would parade the animals in front of Adam, and Adam, he would say, what do you call that? And Adam would say, I think that looks like an elephant. God would say, that's what we'll call it. I mean, no, that's before it got messed up. Whatever. Man called something and declared over it, that's what it is. The Bible says you declare a thing, and it is so. We're right back into kingdom mentality again. The kingdom operates by how we talk. And what we declare into the earth, if you're made in the image and likeness of God, you're made in the image and likeness of God. What you say about a situation, what you say about a person, what you say about something has power behind it. Or you're really not made in His image. Right? So, so what we call something. And so God instructed Moses, He said, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses, stuttering, you know the story, starts arguing with God. And he, he basically makes, and I'm going to paraphrase all this, you guys know the story, but he says, basically, who am I going to tell them or him who sent me? Because understanding the situation, the, the Egyptians, it was a polytheistic nation. You say, what is that? That is a nation of many gods. So for Moses to walk up and say, hey, God told me for you to let us go. They would have said, which God? Which one? Because there's many gods, right? And so Moses goes to God and he says, God, I, who am I going to tell them sent me or told me to say this? And it's interesting because God says to Moses, Moses says, I need a name to tell them. And God said, I could just see God saying, okay, write this down. Moses get his little pen and his stone out or his chisel and his stone. I, guess, I don't know what he was writing with. You know, he did the Ten Commandments. Like, Come on, lighten up a little bit. And God says, I am. And Moses starts going, I am. Okay. God said, that's it. I am. That's it. Everybody say, that's it. He said, I am. Now, you need to understand something, that he gives them this name, I am, and the meaning of that name in English is Jehovah. How many have heard that is a name of God, Jehovah God? But we also have a whole list of names that follow Jehovah. Cassie has taught your children back there all the different names of God. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's Je uh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He's a Jehovah Kid Sanu. He's Jehovah Roar. He's Jehovah. All these different Jehovah names that follow the name Jehovah. Now, I wish I had brought my whiteboard up here because I wanted to write the name Jehovah. So just use your imagination this morning for a minute. And you write the name Jehovah, and then you have all these other names coming down off of Jehovah that are the names following. And it's not to take away from anything. It's not to make him a polyistic God or polytheistic God. But what I'm trying to say is what we kind of got into a couple weeks ago. He is God in this. 
He is God in that. He is God for this. He's my provider, my protector. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. He is all these different things. He's Jehovah this, Jehovah that. He can be all these different things. Do you see that with me? And so he tells Moses to tell him that, and and he goes to, to do that. So Cassie has taught your kids this in kids' church. And here's, here's the setting that, that God set me up with uh, a couple weeks ago with this. He said, and this is what I believe also, I believe one of the problems in the church world today or in Christianity today is that everyone knows God as the God of those things I just listed, all the Jehovah's. We're pretty good with that in church. We got all these different names of who he is. But how many know not everyone has experienced him in every one of those situations? Right? And what you've experienced him as in one of those particular names or definitions, you can relate with that. And from that point on, you can see him as that. Let's just use provider. If God, how many has had God provide for you and you realized it was God and you knew it? So now you recognize God, Jehovah, as my provider. But you might be in a situation where you need a healing and you haven't seen that yet. Or you haven't seen it happen at a church or in someone else's life. You haven't been able to see that happen yet. And so for you, it might be hard to see him as God, the healer. Are you with me? And this is one of the problems I believe we have in the church world right now is people have a polytheistic God mentality. He can be many things, but to me, he's only this thing or these things. And, and if you remember a couple weeks ago, we got into this thing, and we'll get back into this in a minute. I'm just trying to set it up. But oftentimes, people only know God as one of the names or a few of the names, right? And so he's God in some areas of our life, but not in others. This is not to confuse you, but to let you know or let people know that he will be God in every situation. Sometimes, some things we recognize him as God, and some things we don't. It's hard because we don't see him in many of our lives Or we don't see it going on today when it comes to to different types of provision, miracles, illustrations of who God is if we don't see it. Everybody say, I can't see it. There was all kinds of healings in Scripture, all kinds of miracles in Scripture, but not as often in our lives. How many have ever felt that way? I read them in the book. I see Jesus just going through towns, just doing this and doing that. And the disciples, even Jesus' disciples, pray for people, see things happen. There's prison breaks. There's, there's signs and wonders. And I went through this season in my life, and it's like, God, if these are supposed to be common things, why am I not seeing them? Everybody say seeing. And so he began to lead me personally in a direction and asked me to do some things that seemingly had nothing to do with what I just asked him about. And I'll give you one for instance. I said, God, I pulled out of a church parking lot one morning, and in this particular setting, uh, we just weren't seeing anything happen. It didn't feel like to me. And I I was so hard after seeking God and wanting to see him as the God I believed in my heart he could be. And we just weren't seeing it. And I pulled out of the parking lot one day and I said, God, where are these things? And he said, sell your place and move to Oklahoma. What in the world did that have to do with not seeing signs and wonders and miracles at church on Sunday? Amen. And so that's just one illustration. How many have ever had God ask God a question like that and have him respond in a way like that? It's just like totally this way, and you're going, did you hear me? Are you even listening to me? That's, that, that, and, and that's how he does sometimes. And so I want to share with you what God dropped in my heart. So let's go back to the story in Matthew chapter 9, and I want to reread that, and then I want to pull some more stuff out of this. There's about five messages in four verses right here, and so we're just going to do one at a time, not this week. Everybody say, Phew. Yeah. Matthew 9, verses 27 through, I think, 31, but we'll just do a few at a time. When Jesus departed from there, everybody say there, he left one place going to another, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, watch the name. 
son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. They're still following him. And Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And they said to him, yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. Let's just stop right there. We talked about the fact that these two guys were blind, but yet they were still following Jesus a couple weeks ago. Remember that? They couldn't see, but evidently they could recognize him. So just because we're not seeing things in our life doesn't mean that we can't follow Jesus. We covered that. Remember that? Just because I might not have every revelation, I might, not, I, I might not be seeing him in this particular situation or this particular way yet doesn't mean that I can't keep following him. So many people today, it seems like, are weak. I'm not trying to be harsh. It's, we've raised a lot of panty waist generation in the last little while. Everybody's really not a winner, but we told them they were. And so then when they ran into something that they weren't called a winner, they all quit and pout and cry, and they're weak. I listened to Primetime yesterday talking about this being a coach and, and how it's so different now. And, and so, so many people quit. If God, if I, if, you know, it's like I didn't see him today, so forget this church stuff. I tried God once. I tried church once. I tried forgiving once. I tried giving once. I tried doing this once, and it just didn't work. How I many know we need to get some consistency back? We need to get some commitment back. Instead of just trying it one time and quitting, we, 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 we know that God's leading us a certain direction, and we commit. Everybody say commit. And so we talked about this, that these guys were blind, but yet they follow Jesus, and how sometimes in our life we, we may not know everything but, and have all of our senses working, but some of them can be enough to where we recognize this is God's voice. And we follow the voice. Even though we can't see yet, we still follow the voice. How many know that's a good thing? I'm not on negativity right now. This is positive. So these blind guys are surrounded by people who can literally see Jesus, but they're really not receiving from him what they could get because they don't recognize him as who he really is. But the blind guys do, and they cry out to Jesus, and they're following. Then he goes in the house. They follow him in the house. These guys are committed. You can be a play, in a place in your life where it seems hard to see him or not at all, but still follow him. These guys couldn't see him, but they still could recognize him. They were surrounded by people who could see Jesus, but weren't following necessarily. They could see Jesus, but not receive from Jesus. So I want to not only take the pressure off of you or those of you who might have limitations when it comes to your relationship with God or seeing God or hearing God. I want to take that pressure off of you for a minute this morning, but you still want to follow him. How many in here say, I don't have it all figured out? but I still want to follow him. I, I, don't, I don't see him like Mark sees him. I don't hear him like uh, Travis hears him. I don't, I don't operate with my relationship with him like Trevor does, but I, I, I want to follow him. I, I, want, I want to follow him. I want to follow Jesus. That's who I want to start talking to for a little while this morning. I want to follow him. And, I, and also... I want to get you to recognize that just because you don't have everything figured out, I know I'm going over this, but I know I'm supposed to go over this many times. Just because you don't have everything figured out or everything down pat, you don't have every revelation, but you still know that there's something about this Jesus and he's the answer. You know there's still something about this deal. All I know is when I started this direction, things begin to change in my life. I started following even though I couldn't really see it and figure it all out. But God began, I began to see the blessing of the Lord. I began to quit fighting with my spouse as much. I began to, I began, things begin to change and I begin to feel lighter and the, the weightiness of religion and, and some of the things or my bad habits or my addictions begin to fall off as I begin to follow this Jesus wherever he went. And things how many have had your life get better since you started following Jesus? Three of you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Be glad. There's no one blinder than a person who just won't see. It's hard to work with someone who can't see, especially when they think they can. <laughs> You ever been around someone like that? You know they don't know how to do it, but they think they do. That's hard to work with, isn't it? Someone who thinks they know how, but they don't. Someone 
who there's all different illustrations here, and I'm going to, for the sake of time, skip through some of this because I've I've laid on this too long, I think. But we all know that for the most part, we are not supposed to be walking by sight, correct? We started with, I can't see, and then in following Jesus, and we went through this little story a couple weeks ago, but how many know we're really not supposed to be walking by sight, even though that's really what they wanted? How many know we are supposed to, we don't walk by, we walk by what? Faith and not by. So it's, sight, it's faith first and then sight. Everybody say faith then sight. Faith, then I'll see it. Faith, then I'll see him. Moses, stretch your rod over the sea. They say faith. Then he saw it. If he did not act it in faith, he wouldn't have seen it, correct? So this is the order. God's a God of order. We know that. God used many methods to heal people. But there's a common theme that I've noticed in the last probably six weeks and a a common word that I keep coming down to. They recognized Jesus and they cried out loudly to him, Jesus, thou son of David. They recognized him as the Messiah. And we talked about that last time too. Watch this. They knew that the Messiah who was coming was the son of David. And they must have believed that he would have mercy on them. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because they asked for it. They they said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. So they must have in their mind been able to recognize this Messiah that was coming. It was Jesus is who he was and that he would probably have mercy because they asked for it. I mean, you know, if you don't think someone can do something for you, you won't ask for them to do it. How many besides me have ever been in a relationship with someone and you didn't know they were capable of some of the things they were capable of and they could have solved your problem had you knew they knew that and knew to ask them? I watch this with people with God all the time. How many think God could solve any problem? But if we don't see him that way or we don't perceive him that way, we're just going to ask for what we think we can get. Blind guys, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. How many think God, Jesus would have mercy on them? Probably would. That's all they said. They didn't say anything about their blind eyes. They said, have mercy on me. And they kept following him. And they followed him, right? But the text doesn't say that Jesus even responded. Blind guys following Jesus. Remember the story. Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. And then Jesus goes on into a house. Doesn't say how far, we don't know, but he didn't even respond. And so they followed him further. They say they committed. They didn't quit. They needed something from God. So they didn't just try it once. And he didn't respond, so they quit. They followed him. Now I'm going with you. I know there's something about this. I'm coming with him. And they follow him in a house with their stick, feeling their way in, trying to find a way in the only senses that they had, and they follow him in the house. They said again, Jesus, have mercy on us. And then he asks them this question. And we honed in on it last week. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Everybody say this. Can he do this? And that was the whole crux of the message a couple weeks ago. We believe God for that, but do we believe him for this? And he asks them, do you believe that I am able to do this. They could recognize him as the Messiah they'd heard about, one that could save them someday after they died. This is how the mentality in a lot of Christianity is today. Someday I'm going to be well. Someday it's all going to be good. Someday after I die, everybody say die. Then it's really going to be good. But right now, I just got to live this poor, wretched, miserable old life. I just got to hold on till he comes, till I die. How many know that we have inherited something? It is our inheritance, the Bible says, this life that he died for us to have. Who died? He did so we could have it. How many know you don't get anything when you die? (laughs) Not here. 
But the mindset and the understanding is this limitedless God that can just barely meet one or two or a few of my needs or, or lead me and guide me in certain situations, but it'll really get good after I die. What a miserable way to live life. And I hear people, I'm just ready to go ahead and go. I'm just ready to get out of here. And I'm going, you're missing it. I am going, I said this before, I'm going to milk this here and now life for every drop I can get out of it before I go there. I think it's going to be good there. I believe in there. That's fine with me, but I want it here. Amen. And I'm not saying that out of uh, selfishness. He died so we could live, not after we die. So we could have life and have it more abundantly. Everybody say right here and now. So what's the problem? We're going to get there. Hopefully. They saw him as, as, as many people see God today as someday I'll be happy. But Jesus wanted to know, do you think I can do this here right now? What's interesting to me is their response. Look at their response. Pull that verse back up if you would. 28, I believe it is. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Look at their response. And they said to him, yes, Jesus, yes, thou son of David, yes, my Jehovah something, what'd they say? Yes, Lord, and I mean this rung my bell. The difference between <laughs> a limitless God is on what we call him how we perceive him and what we say about him. If he's just one of the Jehovah's, that's all you're going to get. But if you see him as Lord and you declare him as Lord, how many know there's no limit? This is the problem. We've got a mentality in Christianity today. It's like Burger King. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. You can have it your way. Tell your neighbor you can't have it your way. He can't be, I want a little bit of Jesus and then the rest of my stuff on the side. I want my life and a little bit of Jesus on the side. It's like when people order salads at, the, at restaurants. They order a salad and sometimes they want the dressing on the side because they want to put just as much dressing as they want on the salad. They don't want somebody else deciding how much dressing can be on my salad. That's how we are with God. I want my, God, I want my life... And then I want, my, my, I want my Jesus on the side, and I'll decide how much Jesus I want to sprinkle on what parts of my life. Now, I'm going to go old school for a little bit on you. But it's the truth. That's what God laid on my heart. He said the problem is people don't want to call him Lord. We want to call him and pick and choose off the menu of the Jehovah's. He's Jehovah this. He's Jehovah that. I, I believe him for this, but I don't believe him for that. I don't really want him in my business right here. I can handle this one by myself. I'll take this. I'll take that. I should have put a menu up here. I'll take a little bit of Jesus, Jehovah's this, Jehovah this. No, when we get serious, we'll say like the Dr. Pepper commercial, I want it all. I want him all. I want him to be Lord of my life. I want him to be top dog. No questions asked. He is Lord. I believe you're able to do anything. Why? Because you're Lord. Everybody say Lord. Hmm. The biggest limits people have in Christianity today, I believe, is this. You want me to tell the truth or not? Everybody wants the Messiah. They want the Savior. Come save me. Come save me. Come save me from this. I screwed up again. Come save me from this. Save me again. Save me again. Save me from that. Save me someday. Save me. Save me. Save me. I want to keep living like an idiot, but I want you to keep come saving me. Rescue me. Save me, help me, the salvation for someday, the mercy for today. I don't really want to change. I don't want you to be Lord of my life. I just want you to help me each day. I want your blessing, God, but I don't want you to be Lord. Most of us just want God to be the God we see or need at the moment or for what we want, but not everyone wants to call him Lord. 
And then I just had this explosion of scriptures go off in my mind lately of all the places where people called him Lord and what happened. There's a difference when people called him one thing versus Lord. When you start calling him Lord, it, you, don't, you can't just say, well, I'm going to call him Lord so I can get what I want. No, there needs to be a change in here first. There needs to be a submission to him first. We quote the scripture all the time. We take parts of scriptures like, resist the devil and he will flee. But we omitted the first part of that verse that says, submit yourself unto God. Everybody say, Lord. Then, comma, resist the devil and he will flee. If you didn't do the first part, everybody say, order. Don't expect the second and third part to work real well. God, bless my business. I don't want to run it right. I just want you to bless it. God, bless my relationship with my wife or my husband. I don't want to treat her good. I just want you to bless it. You all right? Stay here. We'll get better before it's over. This is the difference between following a Jesus crying out for mercy all of the time and still not being able to see him. It's right here. It's in the word Lord. Say, Lord. What does the scripture say about what's going to eventually happen? Let me start you off with two words. Every knee. Can you finish the verse with me? Every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess what? Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, my healer. Jesus is, no. That Jesus is my question for all of people today is this. You want to call him Lord now or you want to call him Lord eventually? You want to call him Lord today or do you want to call him Lord eventually after you die and you're going to call him Lord anyway even if you don't believe in him now or call it to him now? The Bible says that every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess. Tell your neighbor that's air buddy. He wants them all and he's going to get them all and eventually here or there, you're going to bow your knee and you're going to say, he's Lord. The good news is you don't have to wait and it be a devastating situation for you to call him Lord. The opportunity is right here, right now for him to be Lord of your life. And then you get all the benefits of the Lord. You get all the benefits of letting him be God, letting him be boss, letting him be in control, letting him know that his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Even though I don't see or understand it all, I'm calling him Lord anyway. Well, that was a resounding amen. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Here's what I want you to understand this morning. You can wait till someday to make that change. Submit yourself unto God. Admit, I can't do this on my own. I keep screwing it up. I, I keep messing stuff up. There must be something wrong with me. Maybe I need to let him be Lord of every part of my life, not just parts of my life. In my father's house. Where's his house? Say your, your body. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It is the house of God. Say hello house. In my father's house are many dwelling places. Everybody say rooms. There's certain rooms in your house and my house that we allow certain people into. And there's certain rooms that we don't allow people into. Jesus said, I'm going to there. I'm going to prepare a place where you and I could dwell together. I want him to be Lord in every room in my house. I want to live limitless. I don't want to say, yeah, he's God of my finances, but he's not God of my health. Yeah, he's God of my health, but he's not God of my finances. I just have my money, God. I don't want you to be really be Lord over that. I got that. I got that. I want you to be Lord over my business, but I don't really want you to be Lord over my relationship with my spouse. I got that one. I know them. Are we okay? It's rampant in our world today because people hate authority now more than ever that I've ever heard of. 
because of abuse, bad authority figures, whatever. People hate authority. How many people work with people? Of course, not any of you. But you work with people who do the bare minimum at their job. Or you hear statements like, well, the boss says I want this, but I ain't doing that. I'm not going to do it their way. I'm not going to do it this way. I'm not going to do it that way. I know the Bible says this, but I know I shouldn't do this, but it goes in everything. I know my coach says this, but I heard a really neat phrase this week. Everybody needs a therapist for your past and a coach for your future. Isn't that good? It was prime time that said that. If you remember him, the football player. Everybody needs a therapist for your past and a coach for your future. We got to get back to the relationship with God that he's Lord, that he's God. And I'm going to do whatever he says. And I'm going to go his way. And I'm going to believe him to be Lord. He's above all in everything. Amen? Stay with me. Let's go a little further. We can keep living our life with most things working, like the blind guys. Like your legs still work. Your hearing still works. Your hands kind of work, et cetera. But there's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. If that's all you want in your relationship with God, how many know he'll let you live at whatever limit you want to live? If you want him to just be your savior someday over yonder after you die, how many know that he's good with that? He'll be that too. And you can miss out on all the life here and now that he has for you. You could miss out on the relationships. You could miss out on the opportunities. You could miss out on, on the health that he wants you to live in your, in your physical body. You could, we, can, we could miss out on all this kind of stuff if we just limit him to the God after I die. Or we could take parts of that and say, God, I want you to be this, this part or that part. And I've got, say, three out of five. I'm pretty good. And, we, and you could stay right there if you want. But I really believe in my heart. I'm thinking that there are people listening to me right now and online later who don't want to just follow the voice and chase God all over and cry out for mercy all the time and not be able to see the fullness of what he can do. I feel it. I see it in people more and more all the time. People are rising up and they're wanting to see this God in the fullness of who he can be. Instead of just, yeah, we go to church, but, you know, we really never see anything or do anything. I don't really feel anything at my church. Well, why do you go? Well, because my family always goes there. Do you get anything out of it? No. We really want to go to this church, but we don't go there because, you know, people talk about them. Whatever. There's, oh, we can do it with everything. We can do it with the job. You like your job? No, not really. Well, why don't you get another one? Why don't you do something you like? Well, somebody made a reference this morning to the movie Lion King. That movie rocked my world years ago. It's one of the best movies to preach the whole story of humanity out of in the Bible there is. We are heirs of the king. We are supposed to rule and reign in life. Not in a mean way or in a bad way. It's the order of God. We're supposed to be that, but yet so many of us settle for a life and we run around with meerkats and Warthogs. We surround ourselves with people in our life that are not even like us, don't think like us, don't eat like us, don't, don't have the mentality of, of who we really are, and we start eating the stuff they eat. And we make statements like, well, it's slimy, but it's satisfying. When you could have so much more. I'm watching people, I don't mean to embarrass you, I'm watching people like Whitney who have come to a place in their life and they're like, I'm not done right here. I'm going further and get a hold of some grit and say, I think God's got more for me. I think I can be more than this. I think I can do more than just have a job and raise some kids and do this and, and part-time do something else on the side. I'm going for it all the way. And she's going for it and she's getting better by it because she believes it and she keeps moving for it and declaring it and, and, and declaring and allowing God to be that in her life. And everybody else is going, wow. And I'm thinking, get in line with her. 
Get, find out what she's doing. Find out what's clicking in her life. Find out what she's thinking. Why? Because that's what's moving her forward. She's, I believe, I don't mean to embarrass you. I just believe that she's getting a hold of some stuff that there's no limits. I really believe there's people that want to do this, and it's getting more and more popular. And we're going to do it with God, by God, and through God. Amen? All things are possible to those who believe, but you can do how many things through Christ? I've got another message I'm working on about the difference between doing anything and all things. That just blew up in my spirit the other night. I, was laying, I went to lay down in bed one night, and I, and I heard that phrase, so many people want to do anything, but they don't want to do all things. And I'm going to tell you and show you the difference between that in a few weeks, hopefully, but I think there's some people who are like these two blind guys who aren't satisfied that they might be able to see that they that, that aren't satisfied, that you might not be able to see, but at least you could recognize the voice and follow, and that's not good enough for you. Nothing wrong with that, but listen to me. God's bigger than that. God is limitless. God is, a God is God enough for you. He is God enough for this situation, whatever your this situation is. He's big enough for whatever your this is. He's big enough for any situation that you and I go through. All he wants to know is, are you going to call me son of David or are you going to call me Lord? That's what he told me to say today. Ask the people, are they going to call me son of David or are they going to call me Lord? And I know I'm playing on some words here just a little bit with this. For those of you that understand the depth and the meanings of the words of the names of God, but listen to me. Are you going to call me that or are you going to call me limitless? Are you going to call me Lord of everything? They said, yes, Lord, in verse 28. I started hearing scriptures over and over. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Say limitless. If the Lord is my shepherd, that's different than some of the other names. It's the word that's used to describe the word Jehovah in the Old Testament in all of it put together. When you and I get a revelation that Jesus is all that, the word Lord will start coming out of our mouth. We'll quit calling him Jesus so much, and we'll start calling him Lord. <laughs> What'd Mary say? Be it unto me. I started thinking about the different scriptures and the different miracles where Jesus performed where people called him Lord. And over and over, another verse and another verse kept popping up to me about Jesus. They called him Lord. Listen to me. The someday God or the today God? The someday I'll be this or that or today I'll be this or that. The children of Israel marched around the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because they never would call it today. He was the someday God. He was the God that will be God limitless later. He was, he, he'll, he'll do this some other time. See, when you decide because it's a decision... That God is big enough for this right here, right now. And you begin, the word Lord will automatically start coming out of your mouth. Too many people wait till they die to believe for the Lord stuff. But I've come to remind and revive some people that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't want to die in my generation without showing my kids and grandkids just how big and limitless God really is. I don't want to have to be like the generation in the wilderness that I have to die off and go off the scene so my kids can then see how God can really be. I want to be the one that says, look how big he is. You guys can do anything that he's called you to do. You can do all things that he called you to do through Christ who strengthens you. I'm going to keep calling him Lord right now. I'm going to let my actions follow my faith and stop talking about being saved and start walking in the newness of life. I don't want him to just save me. I want him to, to guide me in everything that I do. He is Lord right now. I want him to be Lord of my thoughts. I want him to be Lord of my actions. I want him to be Lord of my money. I want him to be Lord of my friendships. I want him to be Lord of my businesses. I want him to be Lord of everything I have today. Somebody say today. 
I keep hearing that scripture from David. Psalms 27, 13. Did I give you that one? Watch this. I love David. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would what? See the goodness of the Lord in the land of where? David didn't say, I would have lost heart unless I'd have believed that someday after I'm dead, I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord. But that is the mindset of so many people that call themselves Christians today that I would have lost heart, but I, I just know that someday after I die, he's going to really be Lord. That's not what David said. And this just rings my bell. I would have lost heart. I would have got depressed. I would have given up. I would have quit. I would have, I would have not made it had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, not the dying. I just don't feel like you're getting it like I got it. <laughs> in other words, I'm not waiting till after I die to see the goodness of the Lord. Why does that make people so mad? Why do people get frustrated with that? That's why he died. If he went and paid a price like that and he said out of his own mouth the cross, he said out of his own mouth, I died so you could live. Taylor? And you go, hey, I'll wait. How insulting. Anybody ever tried to raise kids and you provide for those kids and you work for those kids and you sacrifice for those kids and you give for those kids and you provide for those kids or you run a business or a company and you sacrifice and you try to provide jobs and open doors and opportunity and then they go, eh. Anybody ever done that? That's what we're doing to God. And we're like, well, I'll take a little bit of life. But I'll just wait till I die for the rest of it. I'm not trying to be mean this morning. I'm trying to encourage you. We have to wake up to the fact that Jesus, what Jesus did for us 2,000 plus years ago wasn't just so we could barely survive in this life and then someday everything would be great after I'm dead. How many really believes that? If you believe it, stand up. If you believe that it's not that way, let me say it that way then stand up. How many really believe that he wanted to give us life right here, right now, and over there? There we go. <laughs> it's my fault. I'm not making myself clear. I'm not communicating. We have to wake up to the fact that what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago wasn't just so we could barely survive in this life. And then someday everything would be great. Will we have tribulation in this life? Yeah. Will we go through stuff? Absolutely. That's what makes it such, such a blast. The good times and the bad times. How many know you can't appreciate a good time unless you've been through a bad time? We call that a spoiled brat kid that's never been through anything and never lacked for anything or, or missed out on anything. I'm thankful for the hard times that I've been through, and I'm thankful that he's God enough to even though he's limitless, he's not going to make me a spoiled brat kid. He's going to allow me to go through stuff so I can see him as my provider, my protector, my shield. He's going to allow me to go through things in life so, so I know that I don't become that kind of a person. But we can cover, overcome it, we can get through it, and he will use it all for the glory of him and for his glory. Verse 29, did I give you those? He said, well, you might say, Pastor, you've been kind of harsh this morning. I, I, I'm not, there's nothing personal with anybody. This is what he's been dealing with me with over the past two years. Do you want to just keep living the life you're living, or do you want to get with it? You want to die out at 50, 52, 53 years old, just kind of, or do you want to get after it? I said, I want to see everything you told me I'd have. And he said, well, then start doing what I tell you to do. Quit limiting me. 
You're telling me what I can't do. My prayers, I started listening to my prayers back then, a couple years ago. They were sick. And I don't mean that, I, I'm just saying they were sick. They were weak. God, I'd really like to see this happen, but I know there's nobody here to help. You know how I pray now? Thank you, God, because all the help's either here or it's coming. Help me to wake up and see who it is and what it is. Thank you, God, because I lack nothing. Thank you, God, because I have more than enough grass for my cows and hay. Thank you, God, for I have enough everything for the church. I have enough for my kids. I have enough for my grandkids. I thank you because you're more than enough. I just get up and start thanking him and declaring him Lord every day over my life, and I can't keep up with what he's doing. He said, do you think I'm able to do this? They couldn't see. And they said, yes, Lord. And he touched them. See, when we begin to call him Lord, we put him in the proper place. We put him in the proper position of our life. And then he can move and act because he cannot act out of who he is. And who he's not. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. All I'm trying to do with all of you guys is increase your faith in him. Quit allowing your life to be so limited. You can be better. You can do more. You can achieve everything he called you to achieve. I'm not saying you just go pick and choose and I want to be this and that and I'm not going to do anything. He's just going to do it. No, he's going to guide you into becoming and doing everything he created you to be and it eliminates it when you call him Lord. It eliminates all the distractions of you trying to do what you want to do when you start saying Lord. Sarah was barren. Couldn't produce a child until she called Abraham Lord. Boom. You young ladies, be careful. <laughs> You're already pretty productive around here. You're struggling in your marriage? It's a type and shadow. You say, I'm not calling him Lord. He don't act like a Lord. He's a dingbat. Wonder if you would call him what God called him to be, where the pressure would go. I challenge you, if your husband's being a dingbat and an idiot, start calling him Lord and treating him like a Lord. And God will put the heat on him. See, we don't want to do that. Submit yourself unto God. Come on. Do it God's way. Then you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Wife's not acting like the queen she's supposed to be. Maybe you should treat her like the queen she is. Like God said, maybe she'll respond to that better than you're just a nag. You don't appreciate nothing. You don't know. It's what we call it. Start treating your boss like a boss. Watch what happens. That's not brown nosing. That's submitting yourself unto God. That's submitting yourself to authority. Amen? I'm not paying no taxes to the government, damn government. I don't know what Jesus say. Give unto Caesar what's Caesar's and give unto God what's God's. You want to do it right? You want to be blessed? Submit yourself unto God in his ways. Amen? I'm not doing that. Well, go ahead. Don't. Let me know how that works for you. Or you can do it God's way and live limitless. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you again. I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I know sometimes it might seem hard, but it's not. You gave everything so we could have life and have it more abundantly. You gave the most valuable thing you could give to buy humanity back so we could continue to live in the place and the way and the, the life that you created for us to be and have relationship with you and walk and talk with you in the cool of the day. You are our shepherd. 
The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not lack. You lead me beside still waters. You, you make me lay down in green pastures. You restore my soul. I praise you because that's who you really are as Lord. And I pray, God, that people's eyes will begin to be open and will begin to believe and trust in you as Lord and not be afraid of you because we had bad, bad uh, things happen in our life with authority. But we'll realize you are not that person. You are not those people. You are God, and you're God alone, and you're a good father. And you want to provide. You want to do. You want to do the things and give us the things and have us live the life you have for us. I praise you for it, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen.